Okay, before we begin, um, who does not speak Hebrew? One. Me, lot of Anglit. Okay, so it's one versus zero, which means that I will speak in English. Does any of you have any problem with giving the lectures in English? No, okay. It's going to be a simple English. And if needed, I'll translate it to you to Hebrew. So first of all, me, I'm Asaf Fail. Uh, my office is here. Building 202, room 509. And um, my email, stuff.pair at BIU. This is a course in general relativity. Now, OK, uh, one further comment. Um, it's not going to be an easy course. It's a difficult course, but it is worth it. Trust me, it is worth it. Those of you who will survive the next few weeks um, will see that this is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful courses that you're going to study in physics in general. It definitely gives you a completely different perspective of physics. Um, not only of the subject of general relativity, but beyond that. You'll see that many of the things we learned could have a, a very illuminating effect on your understanding of physics in general. Interestingly, there is hardly any prayer requirements, prerequisites for this course. If you think of it from a historical perspective, right, you know, 1905, Einstein came up with special relativity. Ten years later, 1915, came up with the general relativity, which is mostly what we're going to do here. This was before the, day, the days of quantum mechanics. So if you don't understand something very well in quantum mechanics, something doesn't make sense, it's not going to hurt you in any way in this course. It's completely orthogonal. What we're going to do here is considered to be classical general relativity. No quantum mechanics is needed. Of course, build on that, there are more advanced theories, starting from quantum field theories, which are not based on general relativity, but on special relativity, and, uh, and uh, more advanced theories that, that followed that do use both quantum mechanics and general relativity, uh, string theories, etc. It's outside the scope of this course, so don't worry for now. Uh, one more general um, issue. There are very few students in this class, unfortunately. I can see only five of you. Uh, I know that as of yesterday, there were only two registered. I ask you to register, and I ask you to talk to your friends if somebody else would like to come to this course, because five is the minimum that we can have this course. If there are less than you, if you know, one or two of you decide it's, if you don't want to do it, for whatever reason, um, we'll have to cancel this course, which is a pity, because I think it's a very nice and interesting course. But, you know, um, I cannot say anything for those of you who are here, but um, you should be aware of that fact, that if one of you decide to quit or you know, not come or whatever, then we cannot have this course. And that's a pity. Okay, we'll have to postpone it. So, if you have not registered, but you plan to take this course, please register. If you have friends that might consider coming, you may want to talk to them and tell them that it's, um, you know, encourage them to come. It is hard, but it's doable and it's beautiful. Trust me, it is. We will speak about black holes, and we will speak about the Big Bang Theory, and hopefully we'll speak about gravitational waves and all those things that you might have heard in, um, uh, you know, uh, on the public, but we'll make 
physical sense of everything. Okay? General rules. So the lectures are held on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So Wednesday today at 4 to 6. And Thursday it's 12 to 2. Well, one of these hours is considered to be a tutorial. Now, unfortunately, there is no tutor, so it's only me. Um, but I will try to compensate for that in various ways. Mainly, you'll have to, you know, you'll get homework basically every week or nearly every week. We'll see how it goes, which you'll have to solve. And uh, when and if needed, we'll go over problems and uh, various questions. Uh, or there will, might be other topics that I want to put in the tutorials. That's really up to the class. There are various topics that sometimes people ask me to cover which are, not, uh, which are outside the basic syllabus of this course. Um, again, this is the course where sometimes I see students you know, writing eyes. They want me to tell them more than actually required in this course. Okay? Uh, but this is the problem that there is no tutor. So we'll try to compensate for that, but mostly it will rely on you to do your homework and do it on time. Now, because this is a difficult course, uh, you do have to keep up to date very carefully all the time. Um, there are textbooks. I have my lecture notes, which I give you free access to. So you can go on to the Moodle, you can go also to my old website, and you'll find old lecture notes. I keep on modifying and updating and uh, various things. Uh, these are, of course, based on textbooks. Um, and I ask you to please read them. You'll get access, read them. We'll talk about them in the class. You do the homework, and then you ask me questions. You feel free to ask me any question. Come to my office during the class hours, after the class hours. You know, Simply ask me questions. If you ask and I did not answer properly, ask again. Don't be shy. This is really not the place to be shy. Okay? In some sense, you'll see in many ways, if you love physics, you're really going to love this one. Yes? I know. I, last year I went to some of the seminars. I don't think so. But you can check out with uh, the secretary. Because if uh, everybody in the class uh, agrees and there is a, an available room, an available time for everybody, then for me it is, you know, if I don't have any conflict with other lectures I have, then it's okay. It's not easy. Um, you're welcome to go to the secretary today or tomorrow morning and ask them if they can find a different slot. I have serious doubts if that's possible, but you can try. And if it's good with everybody, then it's fine. Uh, I also may use, I also may want to put some lectures on the tutorial because if I'm away for a week or two because of a um, conference or something, right now, as you know, many conferences are being canceled because of the virus. So I, it's quite vague, but it's definitely possible, if everything goes well, that I will be away for a week or two weeks during the semester. So in that case, we need to compensate. We need to find out an extra uh, hour, which will be good for everybody. OK? Um, again, feel free to go to the secretary. Okay. Now, about textbooks, so I said, OK, I said I give you access to my lecture notes. Uh, you'll get homework roughly every week. You're expected to do it. Um, basically, the final grade is 80% your final exam and 20% the homework. You need, so I'm just write it down so it will be clear, 20% homework, 80% exam. Um, do the homework. Do it for you, not for me. Right? You do it for you because if you don't do the homework, it's very, very, very difficult to follow. You'll see there are a lot of tweaks and rounds and many subtle points that uh, are difficult to get to grasp at first point. Okay? Um, give the homework. You have to uh, give them on time. If for any reason you cannot, you have to tell me in advance and ask for a request. Don't come up, you know, 
and uh, at the end of the semester and submit that because I will not accept them. Okay? And uh, it's a pity, right? Now, again, you know, given that we'll have maybe 10, roughly, problem set during the semester, each one counts for 2% of the final grade, but it's not really that, right? It's, uh, sometimes I even use questions from the problem sets in the final exam. So, you know, be honest, do it yourself, don't copy the usual things. Um, and submit them on time. If you have any problem, come to me in advance and tell me I have a problem submitting, can I get an extension? Right. Most often than not, I will give you an extension. But if you don't do it, don't blame anybody. Yeah, I will not at the end come and, and uh, change the rules. Okay, that's not going to happen. Any questions about that? Textbooks. Now, there is no shortage of textbooks in general relativity. You know, the subject exists for more than 100 years now. Um, the problem is to find good textbooks, because a lot of them are really confusing. I'm basing this course mainly on three textbooks. Uh, the first one is by Weinberg, Steven Weinberg. That's a classical textbook, the blue one. Um, it's called uh, Gravitational Cosmology. Uh, it's very mathematical. It's very good if you want to do numerical relativity. It's more difficult to grasp a hold on the physics uh, just by reading this book. Uh, as you're going to see, this course is half physics, half math. Since we're in the physics department, and I'm a physicist and not a mathemat mathematician, uh, I'm going on the, physics part, on the physics side. So that means I will have to teach you the math that you need to understand the physics, but I'm trying to do, there is a very delicate balance, you know, doing the math without getting lost in the math, without understanding, okay, so what is all this math good for? So I think this is the main art of teaching this course. Uh, so, uh, so the first is by Weinberg. It's very good, especially if you're doing numerical relativity. It's a classical one, you know, generations of, uh, of students learn from this book, including myself when I was a student why it's difficult to grasp the hold on the physics. For those of you who find it difficult, kind of the other extreme is by Jim Hartle. Uh, it's called Gravity, an Introduction to Einstein's uh, Theory of Relativity, which kind of takes it to the other extreme. He, he puts a, f a lot of focus on the physics and kind of puts the math on the side. The problem is that without the math, it's just a storytelling, and you can't really understand why things are the way they are. And the whole beauty of general relativity is that it's extremely solid and, and very, very you know, beautifully built construction. Um, so, but you know, if you get lost in the math, I would recommend that you go to the book by Jim Hartle because it gives, I think, um, clear physical insight of uh, what's going on. A third book, which I think is possibly the best of all the three is Sean Carroll. Um, the book is called Space, Time, and Geometry, an Introduction to General Relativity. All these books, by the way, exist in the library, so you can go and take them. Um, I think he's doing the best balanced job between the physics and the math, uh, though I think he goes in the math deeper than what we actually need in this course. So some parts need to be skipped, though, you know, if you want to fool see the full picture, full comprehensive picture, it, it's a very good. Uh, but we don't need all that. Two, several other books that are mentioned, that I mentioned here, this will be posted on the um, Google, right, on the website. So there is a very famous book by Lightman et al. Lightman Press, Price and Tokolsky, it's called Problem Book in Relativity and Gravitation. It's like a you know, huge book, like, I don't know, 600 pages, 20, uh, right now there is no relative motion between the water and the bucket. So if you were an ant that's sitting over here, right, you wouldn't see any motion, any relative motion between you and the water, right? But you could still deduce that you are not in inertial frame because you would see the water surface and you would see that the water surface is not flat. Right? 
Uh, of course, now if the bucket stands still again, so now both the bucket rotates and the water rotates, right? Then if the bucket stands still, right, after a while the bucket stands still, but the water are still rotating. So they have this concave shape. Right. Uh, and eventually it comes to a stop. But the main point is that if you're here, you could tell, although you see, you don't see any relative motion between you and the water, right? Or here the bucket has stopped, but the water still rotates, right? You can still tell that the water is not an inertial frame because of this concave shape. Okay? So this, according to Newton, was a proof that there is indeed this um, absolute space relative to which the water are either flat, mainly, namely in inertial frame, or rotating, namely non-inertial frame. Okay? Yeah? This is like knowing that the equilibrium, knowing the post. Yeah. I mean, if there was some charge in the water. Hey, Newton. This Newton thought of in the 17th century. I don't think they knew anything about electricity back at that time. His whole point was to prove that there is an a absolute reference frame. Okay? No charges, no additional physics, 20th century physics. We're back in Newton's time, yes. Yeah, this, well, of course, this is an example. This is, a, this, is an exp this is a thought exam. I don't know if he actually did that or not, but no. he could definitely do that. I'm not talking about if it's possible mm -hmm. to do that. I'm just talking the idea behind an example. One example doesn't prove that. The idea is the following. In this stage, right, relative to the ant that stands on the side of the bucket, there is no motion. Right? But the ant can still tell that there is a motion. There is a way to tell that there is a motion, even though the ant, if it just looks, you no, know, let's say the ant doesn't look outside, right? There is this motion, but then the motion is relative to what? So the ant will ask itself, well, I can, I can deduce that the, the, what there is, that I am in, in some motion. It's no different than this Coriolis force that we have here, right? We can deduce that there is some motion. But then the motion is relative to what? And then Newton answered, well, in that case, there must be some absolute uh, reference frame. Relative to which we are in a motion. What? He's just presenting a fictitious force example. No, there is no fictitious force here. Well, there is, but okay, you can wait. Of course, there is a force here, right? But the, the point, what Newton tried to, you know, Newton's question was, okay, what, the, what do we mean by an inertial frame? And he thought of that, and that is the answer that he came with. He said, okay, there must be some absolute space. How do I prove that there is an absolute space? He said, okay, well, I can difference, differentiate, right, difference between an absolute space and a non-absolute space, and this is my way of differentiating it. Here, there is no relative motion between the ant and the water, but still, the ant could deduce that it is not on a, um, on a, a inertial frame, just by looking at the shape of the water. This was his point. Okay. okay? Well, Newton lived quite happily and died, I don't know exactly which year. About 150 years later, came another physicist um, called Ernst Mach, which I think you might have heard of if you study fluid dynamics, you know, Mach's number, Mach's principle. You heard about 
Mach. You know what is Mach number? Yeah? Well, it's relative, speed relative to the speed of sound. Right, so it's called Ernst Mach. He's a 19th century physicist, long after Newton died. So that's essentially what you're saying, nearly. He said, Newton's experiment with the rotating vessel of water simply informs us that the relative rotation of the water with respect to the sides of the vessel produces no noticeable centrifugal forces, but that such forces are produced by its relative rotation with respect to the mass of the Earth and other celestial bodies. Which is essentially why you said. Right? Let me repeat that again. I don't want to write it because it's too long. Right? Newton's experiment with the rotating vessel of water simply informs us that the relative rotation of the water with respect to the sides of the vessel produces no noticeable centrifugal forces. Okay, so here there's no centrifugal forces. But that such forces are produced by its relative rotation with respect to the mass of the Earth and other celestial bodies. So what is he saying regarding this absolute space idea? He says, no. What Newton thinks of as an inertial frame is simply a frame that is determined by the mass of the Earth and other celestial bodies that attract the water. Right? We have Earth here that attracts the water. What if there was no Earth and no celestial bodies? What if the entire universe was made out of this bucket and this bucket was rotating? Would the water level still rise? So the idea that the um, inertial frame is determined rel relative to the masses of the Earth and other celestial bodies is called Mach's principle. Well, the inertial frame is determined relative to the mass uh, of Earth and other celestial bodies. So basically what Mach is saying that there is no such thing as an absolute space. We can have an inertial frame but it is relative to the distribution of masses somehow. So this is a contradiction to what Newton believed. There is a conceptual difference, right? Newton said inertial frame is in constant motion relative to some absolute space. Marx says no. What influences whether a frame is inertial or not is masses of other bodies in the nearby, or some distribution of masses in the universe. Okay? Conceptually, this is a very different picture. Interestingly, what we're going to see is that Einstein took some from both. He showed that inertial frames do indeed 
are indeed determined by the influence of masses. But once you are in an inertial frame, you can forget about the existence of masses. They don't affect you anymore. We'll get back to that quite heavily in this course. Right? Questions? Let's go to another subject which I don't know if you thought of that. Equivalence of inertial mass and gravitational mass. I don't know if you ever thought of that. Maybe it's about time to start thinking that issue. Um, what is mass? Equivalence principle. Okay, I don't know if you ever thought of that properly. But masses, what we call mass, have a dual meaning. We say mass, but we mean two very different things. The first we call is an inertial mass. Is the mass that we respond to a force. Right? We put a force on the body, any force, it will start accelerating. Right? How much it will accelerate depends on the force and on the mass. Right? F equal M inertial A. Right? Inertial mass is the mass that appears in Newton's second law of motion. Inertial mass appears in Newton's second law of motion. But mass appears somewhere else. Where does it appear? What? The energy no, you derive the energy equation from here. Where else does it appear? Gravity. In gravity. Yes. Right? There is the Newton's law of gravity, right? It says that F right, minus G M M gravity over R squared. R. You want you can write down as mg. G. Okay, let's stop for a second. So the mass is the coupling constant of the gravitational force. If a particle is charged. Right? And we apply a, an electric force, right? Then rather than M, we'll have what? Q, the charge, right? So we can say that Q is the coupling constant of the object to an electromagnetic force or to an electromagnetic field, to be more precise. The same way, the mass is the coupling constant of the body to a gravitational field. Right? 
Now, when we speak of electromagnetic forces, of course, charge and mass are not the same. And this is used to discriminate particles, right, you know, in accelerators, etc. But you realize that you know, the gravitational mass does not have to be the same as the inertial mass. Right? Because this is equivalent to charge in electromagnetism, right? When you derive the electromagnetic theory, right? You saw that the equation looked very much the same, but there is a different constant, and instead of masses, we have charges. But Newton's second law of motion still holds. Right? So this coupling constant happened to be exactly the same as mi, as the inertial mass. This is an experimental fact. Right? Experimentally, mi is equal to mg. So using capital G, so let's change that. This has been measured to better than 10 to the minus 11. But it doesn't have to be like that. There is nothing that tells us that it has to be like that. Right? The theory doesn't require that the acceleration, this is a general force, not a gravitational force, it could be electric force, right? Could be friction, could be many things, right? Doesn't require that the two masses will be the same. They just experimentally happen to be the same. Okay? You realize that this is a coincidence. I don't know if it's a coincidence. It's a very big question. Well, you realize that. It doesn't have to be like that. But it is. Now, um, this equivalence, this is what led to what's known as the um, uh, principle of equivalence. which basically states that at every point in arbitrary gravitational field, it is possible to choose a locally inertial coordinate system such that within a sufficiently small region of that point, the laws of nature take the same form as in an unaccelerated Cartesian coordinate system. Let me write it down, and then let me explain to you what it means, and then we'll speak a little bit about the experiment here. So, at every point in arbitrary gravitational field, It is possible to choose um, a locally inertial coordinate system. Um, such that within a sufficiently small um, region around that point, the laws of nature take the same form in unaccelerated unaccelerated um, Cartesian coordinate system. Okay. What does it mean? Let's say that you're in an elevator. Okay, you're in an elevator. Big building. Even that building. All right, the elevator is held by some cable. Okay. 
is subject to the gravitational field of Earth. Right? Now the cable is cut. What happens? You free fall. Don't worry, there is a special safety device here that will stop you before you crash. Now you're a physicist. I ask you now, while you're free falling, can you please measure the gravity of Earth? Can you do it? Can you think of a way of measuring the gravitational field of Earth? If you know the moment when you're, uh... No, 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 no. While you're free falling, not at the moment. You are now free falling. You're inside an elevator. It's closed. You cannot look outside. Can you think of a way to measure? You're a scientist, right? All of you. Yeah. I have a brain. I know it's mass. Yeah. Uh, like weight, What's going to happen now? Mass. Yeah. And then I know that uh, basically that um, I can measure the g, right? The small. How do you measure small g? That's that's my question. How do you measure small g? Um, what happens to the brick? You put it here. You're freely falling. There is no weight. Yeah, I it's going to stay here. The, the it's going to st it's going to stay here, right? You're now freely falling with the with the brick. Yeah, but I have the spring, so I think of that. Huh? Think of that. There is no way. Well, to zeroth order, there is a, for a first order. For zeroth order, you cannot. Actually, not to first. It's a second order. For the second order, you could if you're smart enough. But for to to uh, first zeros and first order, there is no way you can measure. Let me rephrase the problem. Right? We're in this classroom. Right? We feel gravity. Right? If you make any. Right? You feel that you know, we're not floating in the air. Right? How um, are you sure that we are? Subject to Earth, maybe we were just kidnapped by aliens who took this entire class and now taking us away from Earth. Let's say then, rather than classroom, right, which is subject to the Earth, right, this classroom is now inside a spaceship which accelerates at some acceleration, A, right? Which is equal to G. You can tell what is the size of the floor. Can you? No, you can't. You cannot, exactly. That's what it means. That's exactly what's written on the board. You cannot tell. If you don't look outside, you cannot tell. That's the meaning of this principle, equivalence principle. Are accelerated right now, right? Now you can measure acceleration, right? But when I'm free falling inside the elevator. Now you cannot measure acceleration. Because if you put a brick or something, yeah. it will just float in the air next to you. This is all a consequence of this inertial mass equal to the gravitational mass. Now I said this is an experimental fact. The guy who worked on that is called Otvosh, it's a Hungarian guy. The experimentalist called Eot Bosch. He 
is Hungarian. And I urge you to go and read about him and his experiment. The nice thing about his experiment is that he put it sometimes in the 19th century, and as far as I know, the experiment is still ongoing. And it can last pretty much forever. And the more it lasts, then, uh, then it, um, um, accuracy gets better and better. So it was experiment. Show mi equal mg. Again, I urge you to go and read about it, even in Wikipedia. I'll just give you briefly. The experiment is very simple. I mean, you take uh, two balls made of different material, say black and uh, purple. You connect them with a rod. And then uh, you hang them by wire. It's called M1. M2. We put a small mirror here to see the flexion of light. And you wait. What forces act on them? On the two masses? Of course, right? So you have right, G1 and G2. What other forces? What? Well, it's a rod, so it's, it's been compensated by the rod. What other forces? So there is a mirror? What? Yeah, there is a mirror here. I put the mirror for, for seeing if there is any uh, twist in the rod. Is that the only forces that act on them? Yeah, okay, there's the normal force in the, in the, yeah, of course. And what else? Is that all? Go back to first year mechanics. No, no, it's, they're held there, they're, they are, uh, well, there, there's another force that acts on them. He lives in Budapest, right? If this is Earth, quarter of the Earth, right? Coriolis, of course, right? Uh, but uh, before Cor Coriolis, right, um, uh, the um, centripetal acceleration, sorry, the centripetal acceleration, exactly. There is a tension and the centripetal acceleration. So, F1. F2, sorry, and F1. Right? So if, no, it's like the Earth is spinning, right? If the experiment is here, right, then the G is in this direction and F is in this direction. Right? So in the frame of the lab, F will be in the altitude. Okay? Now F, of course, depends on the uh, inertial mass. G depends on the gravitational mass. These are made of two, the important is that these are made of two different um, substances, right? Copper and aluminium or whatever you want, right? Yeah, of course, you want to, don't have to, right? And if the ratios of mi over mg is different than one, right, uh, then f1 over f2 would be not the same as uh, G1 over G2, and then you'll see a torque, and then it'll start moving. Okay, read about that. That's homework for tomorrow. Okay, read about the uh, Otfoss experiment. What he was doing there exactly, so that you get a feeling. It's a very fundamental experimental fact. Okay, now, you know, this leads us to the principle of equivalence from which we're going to derive the equations of motion of particle in a gravitational field. 
Uh, and this is basically you know, the first half of this course, or slightly less than the first half. Right. Um, when we speak about gravity, we're interested in two things. Right? One is, how does a particle move in the presence of a gravitational field? Right? Equivalence principle will lead us there. We'll see how it, how it, how it behaves. The second is, um, how does a gravitational field is being formed in the first place? Right? How does the existence of mass produces a gravitational field? And as you're going to see, we already started to discuss that, it's going to curve the space and time. And that's going to lead us to Einstein's field equation, which is the heart of general relativity, right? the curvature of space-time. But what do we mean by curved space-time? I mean, you know, before we even speak about curved space-time, what do we mean by curved spaces? Non-Euclidean, that's right. So, let me give you a few words. I'm not going to explain to you right now. We've got a deeper explanation during the semester. A few words about Riemannian geometry. Double N. So, you know, geometry is a very old branch of science, which goes back to the Greek time. And the great mathematician Euclid, right, um, he basically showed that the entire geometry can be deduced in terms of pure logic following a set of several axioms, right, postulates, things that cannot be proven, but just assumed, right? And, uh, you know, we put a set of several postulates, and essentially all other geometry is derived from that postulate. You know that, right? right. Now, for generations, for generations, mathematicians, you know, throughout history, tried to logically show that the post whether the postulates are real postulates or you can deduce one from the others using pure logic. Now, of particular interest was the uh, fifth postulate, uh, which is called the parallel postulates. So the fifth postulates, or axiom, states the following. Uh, it's, it's called the parallel postulates, right? If a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angle on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which the angles less than the two right angles. It's much easier to draw than to write it down. Right? I have two straight lines, and I have a third line, which crosses these two straight lines. And if the sum of angles here, alpha and beta, alpha plus beta, is less than two right angles, what's going to happen? Then the two straight lines are going to meet, which they, of course, do. Somewhere. Now, for generations, mathematicians try to prove this, that you can deduce this postulate from um, it's called the parallel postulate. Let's just write it down. Um, the parallel postulate. For generations, mathematicians try to prove this one. And uh, interestingly, in 1800, exactly 1800, a mathematician called a gender managed to make one breakthrough, uh, which was to show that this fifth postulate is equivalent to what, do you know? To a different statement. Which is triangle, yeah, what about triangle? 
So it's in Hebrew and I'll translate. No, it's not, nothing to do with Pythagoras. Pythagoras is a name. It's the same name in Hebrew and English. Uh, exactly, but the sum of angles in the triangles is 180 degrees. That was approved by the gender. What? Yeah, yeah. Sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. This is equivalent to the fifth postulate. It was after that, or around that time to be more precise, right, that people started to think of geometries which fulfill all the other postulates set by Euclid except from that one. The general name is of course non-Euclidean geometries. Can you give me an example of a non-Euclidean geometry? So, you know, surface of a bowl, basically, it doesn't have to be Earth, right? If you look at the bowl, and you draw a triangle on the surface of the bowl, right? You're limited to the surface of the bowl. And then drawing a triangle, right? What will be the sum of angles in the triangle? Well, that depends. But the way I plotted it, this is 90 degrees, this is 90 degrees, and if they meet at the North Pole, this is also 90 degrees. So the sum of angles on the triangle, if the triangle is on the surface of a ball, is always more than 180 degrees. But locally, right, as we go on and you look at a very small point, right, the vicinity of a very small point, right, like this classroom, it gets, it becoming, you know, it approaches a Euclidean space. This is an example of a space which is locally Euclidean, but globally is not. Right? Now, some spaces are Euclidean, although they may not look like it. Right? For example, if I take um, conus, right? Conus is really a Euclidean space. I just show you. I just took the paper, right? 2D paper, and I turn it into a conus. It's really right, just a 2D space. A ball isn't. Now, if you ever try to make a map of Earth, you know, the cartographer right, makes some maps, you cannot map every point on a ball to and every point on a 2D space. You're always losing at least one point. People make, point, make maps, you know, they the use Mercator projection, which loses two points. Right? Normally it will be the North and South Pole. But there's nothing special about these points from a geometrical point of view. Right? Can be anything. So, you know, non Euclidean geometries would be geometries that locally look like Euclidean. So, you know, they're, they're well behaved. You know, they don't have spines. We're not talking about, you know, porcupine space. You know, not looking like that. No. They are well behaved locally, but globally they are not. Okay? They look differently. And, uh, Um, this two-dimensional space, the, the, the sphere actually is known as a two-dimensional space with constant positive curvature. So the technical word for it would be 2D space with constant positive curvature. It's much more difficult to envision spaces which have negative curvature, but we will because we'll have to. Actually, maybe it's not that difficult. There'll be more difficult things. No. I don't know. It's much more complicated than that. Um, so, you know, generally the guys who studied this, Gauss, Polya, uh, and Lobachevsky. But the, the real guy that did most of the work, well, all did a lot of work, right? Um, 
called GBL, right? Gauss, Molyai, and Lobachevsky. But the, the, the guy that will be interested in is Karl Gauss. It's the same Gauss from the Gaussian instance. Karl, Karl Friedrich Gauss, the very famous 19th century mathematician. Um, and he looked at the inner properties of this space. That's what we're going to be really interested in. You know, um, we know that the Earth is a sphere, how? You know, if we take an astronaut outside and we look at the Earth, then we can say it's a sphere, right? Some people apparently still don't believe that for some reason. But what if we cannot leave Earth? Right? Is there a way for us without leaving the surface? Let's say that we are ants and we are, you know, the ants. Very good for imaginations of what's happening here, right? Let's say we are ants, right? And we are living on that earth. Does an ant have a way of telling that it lives on a non Euclidean space? Yeah. How? Just take a straight, uh, a straight line. Essentially, like essentially, so there is a way, yeah, you're right. You can do that. It's to be a quite long trip. But the problem is if you can do it locally. No. Well, if the ant's name is Gauss, then yes. Then there is a way. Well, you know, the Earth may not look that great experience, but, but that great um, example, right? But what about the universe? Right. We cannot take a journey through the entire universe. Is there a way for us to deduce from where we are, with the data we can accumulate from Earth, what is the structure of the universe? Whether the universe may look something like that? I realize the consequences. The universe may actually look something like that, may have a global structure of something like a 3D sphere, not a 2D, obviously. Right? You realize what it means? It means that you know, we're building constantly bigger and bigger telescopes, looking further and further away. So if the universe is like that, you know, I'm building a bigger and bigger telescope, eventually, what am I going to see? Back of my head. Right? You know, Magellan travel through the Earth, right? If the universe is like that, that's what it means. We'll discuss that, cosmology. Cosmology is the, the, the name for the uh, global structure of the universe. How we can measure it. What do we know about that? Okay. Um, okay, so Gauss did a lot of work. He did it for two and three days. And then um, he had a student. You've heard a student name, it's called Riemann. He was, uh, did his PhD with uh, Gauss. And what Gauss did was giving to Riemann to generalize the results he found for 2D and 3D to any number of dimensions. So it's called Riemann. And the geometry is known as Riemannian geometry. Essentially generalizing Gauss's results to ND, which is essentially not too many years afterwards. It turns out that this is exactly what we have because the space-time is four dimensions, not three dimensions, as the space is. And this was what was available to Einstein when he came to incorporate gravity into this general picture. Um, <clears throat> because what he showed was that the effect of mass on an otherwise flat space-time is to curve the space-time, to make it non-Euclidean. And how exactly, how do we describe non-Euclidean spaces? How does that work? How does the existence of mass is going to curve the space-time? This is exactly what we're going to study in this course. Right? We're going to study, I told you, two things. One is, how do we describe motions of particles in the vicinity of mass? And since the mass curves space-time, that means, how do we 
describe motion of particles in curved spaces. And the second, this is going to be relatively easy to what comes next. And then the next would be, how does the existence of mass or energy, right, because E is equal to mc squared, it's the same, how does that act to curve the space-time itself in such a way as to produce what we call as gravitational field? That's going to lead us to Einstein's field equation. We're going to derive it, and we're going to find solutions to it. So one solution would be what you know, the Schwarzschild solution, black hole. This is, there are several types of black holes. We'll study the simplest one. It's called Schwarzschild solution. That's a non-rotating black hole, uncharged. We'll speak about the second solution. This is a cosmology. that will lead us to the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe and uh, entire topology of the universe. We'll speak about, um, hopefully, and hopefully if we have time, we'll speak about gravitational waves. This is a weak field approximation, these waves that are in the news since uh, a few years, since they've been detected. Um, and I will give you a good insight of a lot of mathematical and physical structure of 20th century physics, 20th and 21st, obviously. All right, questions? Again, it's not gonna be, you have to work. You have to work hard, but I think it's really, really worth it. Hopefully, you agree with me. Um, please do your homework. For right now, I ask you, first, to think about the things I said. Second, read about Otvos experiment. Third, uh, go and Refresh your minds about special relativity because tomorrow we're going to start doing special relativity. It's going to be the same special relativity that you know of. Now, if you don't find any other resource, you can go online. I taught first years mechanics in a different university, so just Google me and you'll find my webpage and it's called PY1052. It's first year and there is a lecture about special relativity and Lorentz transformation something which is suitable for first year students. Go read it, it'll be very easy. And then I'll put online the, my lecture notes. You can start reading them uh, about general relativity, about this uh, course. It's gonna be the first part is special relativity. It's the same special relativity, just written in a very different language, um, which can be very confusing at first and after you get used to it, it's like, oh, how could we do without it? It's going to be very, very simple and straightforward after, after that. It's going to make a lot of sense. What I really love about this course is that once you get used to it, you see that it's solid rock. There is no way out. You have to follow very logical, mathematical steps which enforce you to get to these conclusions. Any questions? My final two requests from you, as I said, I see six students in this class right now. Um, as far as I know, since yesterday, there are only two registered. In order for us to be able to give this course, I need to have five people registered. Uh, if you think of taking it, please register. Please talk to your colleagues that might be interested in taking it and don't take it for I don't know why. If you want us to shift the time, go and consult with, um, with the secretary. I'm willing to consider, provided that I don't have any other conflict. Um, and that, there, of course, there, are, there is open rooms and everything. So please do that. And otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock. Any further questions, comments? Again, if you do have questions, Ask. Don't wait because it's going to be very confusing very quickly. Okay? I'm warning you right now. If you have any questions, ask, stop me. Tell me, okay, please repeat, we don't understand. If I did not answer properly to your satisfaction, ask again. Don't be shy. This is not a course for shy people. This is a course for people who want to know physics. All right? Did any of you have non-English speakers have any problem with the English? No? Good.
See you tomorrow, guys.